Hey everyone and welcome back to Crisis of Crime. My name is Rachel Means and I am a criminologist. Thank you for joining me for my weekly podcast where we talk about criminology and criminal justice reform. Today I want to talk about the juvenile justice system and I specifically want to talk about some big changes that have happened in Missouri for their Department of Youth Services. And the reason is because Missouri's Department of Youth Services, or DYS as I'm going to refer to it in the podcast, has created a radical new juvenile justice model that is redefining what the juvenile justice system is and the outcomes that they're seeing. So the Missouri DYS has created multiple facilities throughout the state with varying degrees of supervision. And this is an attempt to keep the youth or the kids that are there close to their homes. And depending on the facility, it has different levels of security for the residents. Now, just a little info about the Missouri Department of Youth Services. They have facilities for their juvenile criminal justice system where they house kids who have committed a wide variety of different crimes ranging from nonviolent misdemeanors all the way up to violent felonies. And that's why there's the different level of facilities depending on the type of crime that was committed. In Missouri, a juvenile delinquent is anywhere between the ages of 10 and to their 18th birthday. Any new crimes that are committed after their 18th birthday will be tried in an adult court. These facilities that the kids are in, they don't look like regular detention centers. There aren't any cells or concrete floors or anything like that. They actually resemble more of what a dorm looks like, where you'll have a room with multiple bunk beds, and then you'll also have a common area. So the kids that are here, they're broken up into groups of about 10 to 12 kids and they all stick together and they're of different age groups and they get assigned to designated staff members. So the reason that they do this is they want to be able to have mutual respect among the kids and the supervisors there, but they also want to build trust. So when they're only interacting with a few different supervisors, they're able to really get to know them. They're allowed to call them by their first name and they promote healthy communication between the kids and their supervisors as well as within the kids themselves. And through doing this, the staff is able to form these really tight bonds with the kids where they gain their trust and they're able to really help them and help them rehabilitate. So there were two main goals that Missouri DOIS wanted to focus on with their juvenile justice system. They wanted to focus on continuing education for the kids when they're when they're at their facility and also to create detailed aftercare plans for when the kids are released back into the community that they have a smooth transition and they are successful in it and therefore will reduce the chances of recidivism, which of course is the likelihood that that person is going to re-enter the criminal justice system at some point, whether it is from committing another crime or some kind of technical violation like paperwork or missing a drug test or something like that. So the reason that Missouri DYS chose continuing education as one of their primary goals for their facilities was that the National Council on Crime and Delinquency found that only 25% of the youth in the juvenile criminal justice system were achieving the same amount of learning that they would in a public school. The way they were able to gather that data was by giving a standardized test when the kids arrived and when they left. Now this raises a huge issue for the kids that are transitioning out of these facilities and back into school. If they are arriving in school and now they're not at the same level as their peers, they may be held back a grade or they may be put into the same grade and start failing in their studies because they aren't meeting the same standards. They haven't had the same quality of education as everybody else. And we do have evidence that low literacy rates and poor education do contribute to the likelihood that somebody is going to engage in criminal activity. So right there, we're setting these kids up for recidivism, that they're going to re-enter the justice system at some point. The second main focus of the Missouri DYS was to create those detailed aftercare plans to help those kids transition back into the community after they leave these facilities. Now they may be transitioning back into school or they might be transitioning to work depending on their age. So the Missouri DYS has created a network of intensive aftercare support. So each kid is going to get a personalized case manager that's going to work with them and their family to help them achieve success once they are released from their detention center. And here is just the cherry on top. So not only does having a good transition help the kid get back on their feet after they're released from the facility, but it also saves the taxpayer a ton of money. According to experts, the taxpayer can save anywhere between three to six million dollars per kid by deterring them from a life of crime. 
And those costs are a result of going through the criminal justice system and the costs associated with the victims. An objective of the Missouri DYS in relation to educational progress is something that they call building skills for success. And this objective lays out the workings to improve educational progress for the kids at their facilities. The main components that go into building skills for success are fostering self-awareness, communication skills, pursuing academic progress, and opportunities for hands-on learning. So the goal of these facilities is for the kids to be self-aware and learn how to communicate properly and build that relationship and trust with other peers and with their supervisors. So the supervisors are going to help them achieve this by showing them the same amount of respect that they are hoping to have back. So mutual respect on both ends. And their hope is to help the kids become more confident and competent in their communication skills. A huge part of this is that the kids are encouraged to talk about their feelings and to be completely honest with how they are feeling, whether they are frustrated, sad, angry, feeling disrespected, whatever it is, they are encouraged to talk about that. The supervisors have what they call a check-in where no matter what is going on, they can say, okay, let's check in and everything just pauses for the supervisor and that kid and they just talk about how they're feeling. and. Once they've built that relationship of mutual respect and trust, they're able to just check in, lay it out on the line, this is how I'm feeling, and then they're able to move forward from that. And these check-ins don't have to be long, but they can be if they need to be. And that's the flexibility that the supervisors are providing to the kids at these facilities where they're really addressing their mental health along with rehabilitation because that is such a huge part and it cannot be ignored. So as I mentioned before, another component of the building skills for success is pursuing academic progress. Now the Missouri DYS is going about this in a quite unconventional way, not the way that we've seen it done in other facilities or even schools at that matter. So I mentioned earlier that the kids are put into groups of about 10 to 12 peers, and they're all of different ages, and they actually stay in these groups when they do their schooling as well. They don't break them up by age group or grade level. And there are multiple reasons behind this logic of why they're doing it. For starters, is because those groups are very tight knit. They've learned how to communicate with each other. They trust each other and they are comfortable around each other. So they're able to relax and learn. And because it is a smaller group, the educators are able to tailor each kid's education to them rather than teaching as a whole group. And on top of that, because you have different age ranges, the older kids in the group are those who are at a higher grade level are able to help those who are younger or at a lower grade level. And this not only instills confidence in the ones who are helping tutor, but it also helps further build that trust between the peers. Additionally, any students with disabilities or special needs is always assigned to a special education teacher. Now, if you'll remember, I said only 25% of the kids in the juvenile criminal justice system were achieving the same amount of learning that they would have if they had continued in public school. Well, with this model, with the Missouri DYS, 90% of the kids are able to achieve the same level of education that they would have gotten if they had stayed in public school. Now, the last component that I mentioned in building skills for success is the opportunities for hands-on learning where the kids are able to apply the skills that they've learned to real life. We all know that everybody learns differently. Some people need to read stuff, some people need to hear stuff, but a lot of us have to be very hands-on to be able to learn. Throughout my time of working with children, I can attest to this. As soon as you get their little hands working, they are learning so much more than if they are just staring at you and you're talking at them. So the kids in these facilities, they're doing stuff like building soapbox cars and having derby races to practice their math and science skills. They perform Shakespeare to learn their literature. They also get involved with community service, helping out at places like homeless shelters, retirement homes, and hospitals. And for the kids who are of age to hold employment, they're able to do their community service where they're actually paid a minimum wage at one of the facilities that partners with DYS. This might be something like working with the state park system or with the park rangers to maintain the grounds. So we've talked about the educational component and building skills for success, 
But now I want to talk about the aftercare planning because they have objectives here too. The main objectives with the aftercare planning are pre-release planning, continuing custody, and monitoring and mentoring in the community. So during the first phase, the pre-release planning phase, the kids are going to meet with their service coordinator along with their family and their supervisor. So it's a big multidisciplinary approach where everybody is involved. During these meetings, the group is going to focus on what's going to happen when the kid leaves the facility. Are they going to be re-enrolling in school? Are they going to be looking for a job? Are they maybe going to be joining the military? A big focus is working with the family to make sure that the kid is going to have a structured environment once they return home. Things like having ground rules and curfews and things like that. And something that happens during this phase that's really interesting is they give the kids furloughs where they're able to go home for a short amount of time and then come back to the facility. And so they're able to test that kid's readiness to re-enter society because they're able to really identify problems that they're having during those furloughs. The second phase is continuing custody. So this is once the kid is actually released from the facility. So they're still going to be under somebody's custody, whether it's their supervisor or their service coordinator. And that's going to last for four to six months following their release. So during this time, like I said, they're still in custody. They're technically still under the Department of Youth Services jurisdiction, but they're able to go back to their house and be with their family and be in the community. But because they're technically still under the DYS jurisdiction, if they have to take them back into custody, they don't have to go through the courts or anything like that. They're able to just bring them back to the facility. The final phase of the aftercare planning is the monitoring and mentoring within the community. During this phase, the kid is released back into the community. They're no longer under the jurisdiction of DYS but they still maintain contact with their service coordinator. And they might also be assigned a community-based mentor. This is usually like a college student who's studying human services or social work. And the goal of the mentors is to have somebody in the community who's able to make a positive influence on their lives and help keep them on track. Another really interesting thing that they do in the Missouri DYS is They do not take a traditional path when it comes to what the kid's sentence is. So usually you go to court, the judge hands down a sentence, and that juvenile delinquent has to fulfill that sentence at a juvenile detention center. But Missouri DIS does it a little bit differently. So each kid's sentence is actually based off their progress in the program. They are in control of how long they are going to stay in custody with the Department of Youth Services. Now, of course, it's not based on how the supervisors are subjectively seeing how the kids are doing. There is an actual program with steps that the kids have to go through. And once they reach that final step, they will assess how they're doing. So the very first step is orientation. This is the step where the kids are introduced to the program and they have time to become acclimated to it. They learn what all their expectations are, and they're also going to be starting to form those bonds with other peers in their group and their assigned supervisors. The next level after orientation is called discovery, and this is where the kids are really going to be looking inwards at themselves to see how the issues in their personal lives have contributed to the path that brought them to where they are now in the Department of Youth Services. And this may consist of different things like looking at their family life or looking at any personal issues that they've had. And the kids are encouraged to open up about their past and they're going to be given the tools to help heal and to move forward. And we've talked a little bit about that with the check-ins and the communication and focusing on mental health. A huge part of this step too is they also learn to take responsibilities for their crimes. And not only is this going to help them grow, but hopefully it's going to help reduce the likelihood that they will reoffend in the future. The third level is integration. And this is where they are going to take everything that they've learned in self-discovery and they are going to apply it. For example, they might take on more responsibility. They may lead a student group activity or they'll be encouraged to use the new positive communication skills that they've learned during their discovery phase to communicate with their parents and their families or their other peers. 
Integration is also the level where they'll be able to start branching out into the community, whether it's working with community service or if they're old enough, like I talked about, maybe getting that job where they're getting paid minimum wage working with something like the park services. The final level is transition. And it's during this level that the kids are going to be preparing to transition back into society. And this is with the help of that aftercare planning that we talked about. So the kids are gonna be working with their staff, their service coordinator, their families, and their community to ensure that they're able to successfully transition back into society. Now it's unfortunate that this is just for the Missouri DYS. This is not a nationwide thing, but could you imagine how much better off our youth would be if we were to make this nationwide? I know I didn't get a lot into the problems that we're currently seeing in our juvenile criminal justice system, but just to kind of reiterate what I've said, only 25% of the kids who are in our juvenile justice system are being educated on the same par as they would be with public schools. And in a lot of cases, there's hardly any kind of transitional planning for aftercare. So the kids are getting released and they don't have a support system. They don't have people to keep them accountable and they are reoffending or missing some menial tasks that they were supposed to do and they end up back in the juvenile criminal justice system and it becomes a cycle and once those kids are in that cycle of criminal activity it's very hard to get out of a study by MIT found that 40% of kids who went to juvenile detention ended up in prison by the time that they were 25 Now, if you listen to my podcast, you've heard me talk about prevention. So of course, preventative efforts before these kids have even reached the juvenile criminal justice system would be preferred, but we aren't going to be able to prevent all crimes by juvenile delinquents. So once they enter that system, it is our responsibility as a country to do our best to rehabilitate them, to set them up for success, and to help them successfully transition back into society. And a lot of kids who are going through the juvenile justice system are not set up for success whether it's the family problems that they're having, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's trauma that they went through or are currently going through. There's so many factors of why kids end up in the juvenile criminal justice system. But my hope, and hopefully you now, since you've listened to me talk about it, is that we can get something like this nationwide so that we can really set our kids up for success because they are going to be the ones running the show and I sound like my parents now. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you want to learn more about me and what I do, please go to my website. It is www.crisisofcrime.com. You'll be able to find all my other podcasts on there as well as my YouTube videos and all of my links to social media. If you are interested in supporting me, I do have a support tab where you can sign up to become a patron. Another way you can support me is just to like and share this podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in today and I will see you next time.